If you want to support Slopes Game Room, then please click the links that you see in the top comments. <laughs> Vroom, vroom! Rev up for a fast and furious racetrack challenge in your turbocharged Dragon Special. Streak down the road, overtaking all the opposition. How far can you get without crashing? Back in 1983, if you had this magazine, then it's likely that you saw this blurb about the game Roadrunner for the Dragon 32. You see, getting free demos, or in this case, a complete game with your gaming magazine was commonplace, even back then. However, there was one slight difference. Oh yes, that's right, because if you're looking for a demo disc, a cartridge, a floppy, or even a cassette tape, then you're out of luck. Because back then, if you wanted to try out new games, all you had to do was type all of this in. And voila, if you've just typed in every single character correctly after a bit of loading, then you would be happily playing Roadrunner. What you're looking at here is the very first game ever created by the Oliver Twins. Now it may look basic, you know, because it is, but what you've got to remember is that this was 1983. It was free inside of a magazine and it was created by two brothers who were only 13 years old at the time. They created the code, sent it into Computer and Video Games magazine and boom, they just became £10 better off. Well, actually it wasn't all that quick. The game ended up taking about a year to get published after it was sent in by Philip Oliver and by this point he didn't even have a Dragon 32 anymore. He had moved on and traded it in for a BBC Model B. But still, quite the achievement for the young lads as I'm sure you will all agree. Now with all of the crazy gaming stories still to be told and incredible gaming histories that I am yet to cover, you may be asking yourself why is Slope's Game Room covering this this nothing game because I love gaming history and although this may look like just another standard micro game which you know it technically is obviously there's a lot more to it than meets the eye what the Oliver Twins just created was in fact one of the most important first steps that the 8-bit home computer gaming market ever got. Because these 51 lines of code and several letters chasing the magazine to finally get their £10 propelled the boys' interest into home computers even more as they continued on with their passion and eventually created the most popular home computer mascot of the late 80s. Dizzy. Yes, he may be almost unheard of to a lot of the world, but ask any gaming fan that grew up in Europe during the mid to late 80s about Dizzy, and you're likely to find yourself standing in front of an overly nostalgic middle-aged man, reminiscing of the good times, remembering one of the many entries of the most successful British video game franchises for the time. A series where you play as an anthropomorphic egg named Dizzy, traversing through various fantasy settings, meeting and helping your friends and family, better known as the Yoke Folk, to achieve whatever the game's challenge may have been, in a mostly platform and puzzle heavy setting. Over 20 games, spin-offs and re-releases would follow to this very day, with an endless amount of games being rediscovered it seems, and to that small but dedicated group of followers who remember these titles from their youth, the Oliver Twins still thankfully tour the country to show off what they have done and more importantly, retell the history of many people's, mine included, first ever video game mascot. Oh yes, before the days of Sonic the Hedgehog, before I even knew what a Sega was or a Nintendo, this little egg looking thing took over my life. It was a complete obsession of mine. I would play his games endlessly on my Amstrad CPC 464, I'd buy every game I could get my hands on, and one of the later entries was the first game that I ever completed. But yet again, I think we're in fact getting a little ahead of ourselves. So let's go back to the beginning, to the birth of Dizzy, and tell the story of how a couple of young teenage boys changed the lives of many during the late 80s and early 90s. This is the complete history of Dizzy. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. 
Papa. With a little help from me, Novabuck. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the late 70s. Here we have Philip and Andrew Oliver, a couple of twins that love nothing more than looking to the future. A very 70s stylized future glorified by the likes of Star Wars, Thunderbirds, Buck Rogers, Star Trek, and all that typical good retro stuff, of course. This obviously led them down a path fascinated by computers and gaming with their first ever device being the extremely limited Merlin handheld. A handheld that has several modes of play and interacts with you via bleeps and LED lights. This continued on with the family getting Pong clone systems and the boys discovering arcade classics such as Space Invaders and Pac-Man. And they could also be found playing games such as Taxman and Zork on a friend's Apple II. However, in December of 1981, the duo was finally able to get their hands on a Sinclair ZX81. They were fascinated, reading the manual over and over, trying their best to make their own games with the limited 1K of RAM that the system had. Their school was offering up basic language courses, which the two jumped at the chance of studying, and although that was good, it became incredibly frustrating for the duo, coming home and trying to implement these ideas into the ZX81. They needed an upgrade, and that upgrade was the Dragon 32, paid for by doing odd jobs around the house and about six months of paper rounds. Finally, a new system for the guys to go home and play games like Asteroid, Centipede and Missile Command, which they always played in the arcades on their Cornwall base holidays, right? Right? Sadly not. Games existed for the Dragon 32, but due to poor sales of the system, very few were made. Well, in comparison to the competition at least. And this frustrated the lads to no end. Constantly picking up magazines like computer and video games, and you know, because of the desperation, trying to put in all of these lines of text needed to play games for other systems with the hope that they would load up something, anything on their Dragon 32. But obviously, this would just never work. In other words, it was like trying to play a Mega Drive cartridge on a Super Nintendo. <laughs> Good luck. The boys were desperate to play decent games on their Dragon 32, and so with their basic computer knowledge behind them, they decided to make a game of their own. Because they didn't have a printer, they would handwrite the code as neatly as they could and then they would give it to their mother who would take it into work and use a typewriter to neatly punch it onto paper for them. They could then send it into the magazine in the hope that it would be featured. No one ever thought about simply putting it onto a tape though. When they got the typewriter document back from their mother, they would often find errors in her handiwork, like a comma instead of a full stop, and accidentally added spaces. These errors would then be highlighted with a red pen and then handed back to her with the instructions to go back to the office and type it out again. Oh, poor woman! Anyway, as stated, the article was printed about a year later for all Dragon 32 users to see and enjoy. They took their hard-earned £10, but as stated, they had already realised that they had reached the end of what was possible with the Dragon 32. It was time to move on. Now their hearts were set on the BBC Model B. They had traded in the Dragon 32, saved up plenty more dosh with a nice injection from the parents, of course, and got to work trying to understand BBC's more advanced basic language. Which now almost brings us up to the 90s, when the duo came across a competition on a Saturday morning TV show to design their very own game. We thought we had nothing to lose and would go and try and write a game and send it in. At this point, we'd only just bought the BBC Model B and only knew BASIC, so we decided to make a game that wouldn't require as much speed since BASIC was pretty slow. We came up with the idea of a board game on a computer and called it Strategy. By then, we only had a couple of weeks to write it if we were going to get it in for the closing date. A couple of weeks later, the duo got home from school, the phone rang, one of them answered, and the voice at the end confirmed that they were indeed the winners of the competition. That Friday, the two ditched school and took an all-expenses-paid trip to Birmingham to appear on TV. Oh, now 
it's time to find out who's won our computer competition. You remember a few weeks ago we asked you to design a game and send it in either as a drawing or else as a cassette. Well, our computer competition winners, Philip and Andrew Oliver from Trowbridge in Wiltshire. Where are they? <laughs> Come down, guys. Let's have a look. Why don't you go? Why not go either side? One either side. That's it. Somebody over with Chris. Right. Come over here with me. That's it. That's splendid. Which is which? I'm Andrew. Andrew. I'm Philip. Andrew and Philip. All right. Why did you actually write it, and what was the basis for it? Um, well, a lot of people have been trying to write arcade games in BASIC, which are far too slow, and we really thought we couldn't get one sort of a high enough quality, so we had to turn to a slow game, sort of more family game, and we came up with this idea after playing some board games. Okay, I mean, what, how did you actually go about designing the game and actually putting it into the computer? Do you have any problems as you put it together? Um, well, I, I wrote it on paper and my brother typed it in. Uh, we tested it, found hundreds of mistakes. And after sort of a week of work, we managed to iron most of them out. Great. You've got to try and get each player into the middle and you're only allowed to turn a corner at the end of a dice shake or when you hit a wall. I wonder these okay. guys' prizes anyway, and I know that everybody will be green with envy. They got a nice computer of their own at home, so we said, why don't you choose another prize? And you've decided to go for what's called a high-resolution monitor, whatever that is, for goodness sake. I suppose you lot know. <laughs> Sounds like something who collects the rubbers at the end of class. But anyway, a high-resolution monitor, and also the possibility that top manufacturers, Commodore, are going to market your game, and it'll actually appear on the high street. So once again, congratulations to the winners of our computer competition, the Olivers! <laughs> After a long, long, long wait, the brothers got their first game ever published. They got a new monitor and they got royalties of only £166.41 due to some rather extreme and crappy delays of the game's release that, for whatever reason, was released alongside another game called Black Box, which meant all the money that had been earned had to be split between two developers. Now it's fair to say that their first game wasn't exactly the overwhelming success that they had hoped for. It showcased to the duo what it was like to get a game published. This was a hard pill that the Oliver Twins had no choice but to swallow multiple times during their coding life. As time went by, the Twins' skills and unfortunate dealings with publishers continued on over the years, but no matter how many times they got knocked down, the duo's constant push to create fresh ideas for new systems just kept them going. They even set up a computer club at lunchtimes at school, for educational purposes of course, and they used this as a testing ground for their upcoming projects. But as you probably guessed, teenagers and teenage gamers at that were pretty harsh with their reviews. Constantly comparing the games to the more obvious greats found in the wild, Shorty's critics were a tad meaner than they perhaps should have been, but it pushed the Oliver Twins to make their games better. Games such as Rescue Mission and Cavey were created early on using the Twins' custom art design programs such as Easy Art and eventually further down the line Panda Sprites, but it was never clear sailing. Sometimes they would get royalties, although most of the time they needed to chase for those royalties just like I said before. And more often than not, those royalties were more than a little disappointing. The duo decided that enough was enough. They wanted to make a proper game and they wanted to work with someone that understood the time and effort it took to create a big proper game like this. Easier said than done. That was until they went along to a home computer convention in Hammersmith to pitch their idea of Super Robin Hood, a big name license that didn't require the purchasing of any rights to whoever they saw fit to take it on. And it was here that they met a couple of lads who, similar to the Oliver Twins, had been making games of their own for a company called Mastertronic, and now they wanted to become a publisher. The lads in question were David and Richard Darling, and that company was Codemasters. Uh, Slopes, that's the wrong logo, mate. Thank you. Here you had two fledgling individuals who not only understood what it took to become a publisher, but were actually game developers themselves. After Andrew and Philip shared their idea for Super Robin Hood, a big budget game that apparently would be finished in only a month's time, Codemasters were impressed and on the spot agreed to take it on for £10,000. Whoa, 
the Oliver Twins had never got anywhere near that kind of money in the past. And with that, the two ran back and got to work coding this thing using only one Amstrad computer to do so. And they did this in shifts between them for 18 hours each every single day, taking turns to use the one machine they had and working out a sleeping pattern that kept the machine on for 23 hours a day, only turning it off twice during that time to give it a 30 minute breather and to watch some cartoons. And thankfully because of their persistence, the two did manage to get the game finished and Codemasters absolutely loved it. However, upon showing the finished title to the newly formed family business that was Codemasters, a renegotiation was reluctantly signed, dropping the original amount suggested from £10,000 to 13.5p per copy sold. The duo were not happy about this new deal, but what other choice did they have? Straight off the bat, they would get a shade over £2,500 as the first print run would see 20,000 copies being produced and although that's a far cry from $10,000 originally promised, it was still a fair amount more than they had ever got before for a single project. So um, yeah, boom, I suppose. <sighs> and when that game did eventually drop, to say it was a success is a severe understatement. The critics loved it, the gamers loved it, it hit number one in pretty much every chart going. It got ported to the Commodore 64, the ZX Spectrum, and this netted the boys an extra 5p per copy, and in the end, the duo earned around double the initial proposed amount. Within the world of home computer gaming, the Oliver Twins became synonymous with quality, not only with this excellent release, but also titles such as Ghost Hunters and Grand Prix Simulator. In fact, it was whilst they worked on the aforementioned Ghost Hunters that they became frustrated with the inability to create a character that showed any kind of expression or emotion. This was when they came up with the idea to simply make the vast majority of the character's sprite into a face. Obviously by doing this, it gave the duo more opportunity to play with the pixels inside that area to give off an emotion. A head can't move around on its own, so I added red boots and gloves. I tidied it up and made it egg-shaped, it looked quite cute. I thought it would be fun to see what it looked like doing a barrel roll, which I could do with the panda sprite's rotation function. We decided to swap out Hunk for this new egg character in Ghost Hunters and put some code in to control him and do a barrel roll. It was a fun distraction for half a day, but at that time we decided to carry on and finish Ghost Hunters as planned with Hunk the way he was. So yeah, as you've probably worked out already, it was after Ghost Hunters that the two decided to revive that accidentally made egg-looking character and put him into his own game. He was far more cutesy and fun to look at than what was created before and because the twins had the ability to change his expressions based on his surroundings, they had just accidentally and unknowingly created their first true video game mascot. And as we've already covered, the duo didn't really have too many problems creating great worlds and great games beforehand, so now they just needed to do the same thing with this spinning egg looking character too. One of the ways the brothers used to chill out during the heavy coding sessions was that at 4pm every day they would go into the living room and watch some classic cartoons with a cup of coffee and a plate of biscuits. These legendary cartoon characters no doubt helped with the desire to create their own memorable mascot, but this also inspired them to push the idea even further by putting their creation in a cartoony like fantasy world to explore, adding some simple platforming and puzzling inspired by old text adventure games of their youth. Everything was coming along brilliantly during the development of this game. The world was filling up nicely with every area you reach looking so good that it would work as the perfect marketing screenshot inspired by movies such as Indiana Jones, The Hobbit and even Superman. And the name of the original world actually came from the poem The Green Eye of the Yellow God. Now that's fine and all, but what about the egg? How did the two come up with the name for the egg? Well, unsurprisingly, that name came from its barrel roll. When the Oliver Twins' dad walked in one day and saw the little yoke-filled hero jumping about the screen, he made a remark that all that spinning around would make him rather dizzy. Dizzy, the ultimate cartoon adventure! 
The first game was reluctantly released by Codemasters, who were not that fond of the title at first, and only really published it due to the success of the Oliver Twins' earlier titles. Worried that nobody would really care about the game in the same way they would ghost hunting, Grand Prixing, and of course Robin Hooding, the company decided to add a Buy the Oliver Twin stamp on the terrible front cover to help move units, which honestly, didn't help all that much. Whilst the twins had already moved on to their next game, Dizzy the Ultimate Cartoon Adventure, as predicted, wasn't doing all that hot. It was a really slow burner, but thankfully, as time went on, more people played it and those gamers and reviewers really did start to understand and appreciate this unique little title. Where other games did well straight away and then quickly burned off, word was spreading about this white shell covered little gem, and over time, sales started to rise and they continued to do so staying consistent for quite a while. So, does Dizzy the Ultimate Cartoon Adventure live up to its subtitle? Does it warrant spawning gaming's most unsung hero? Well, mostly yes. As a first entry into an unforeseen franchise, this first outing stands up well. The format lays down solid foundations and a style that would progress into a much more refined series, with the primary hero and villain established and a fantastical quest to complete. Dizzy is tasked to create the Averwifavy Potion, to banish the evil wizard Zax from the lands of Kathmandu. He has to collect various items scattered around the world to achieve this, making this a game of exploration, puzzle and platform precision. It's a challenge to be sure, frustrating at times, but a genuinely fulfilling adventure and something which leaves a taste for more to come. The graphics are typical of the four colour mode of the Amstrad, but this is the correct choice as the detail of the environment is wonderfully presented and gives the Dizzy games an unmistakable signature for both the Amstrad and the Spectrum. Dizzy's animation is smooth and responsive, once you get used to the somersault jumps, the pinpoint judgement and of course the flick screen style fits the game well. While functional and fun, the visuals are nothing remarkable for the time. However, the music by John Paul Eldridge pulls off a rare feat of being a toe-tapping, repetitive chiptune without getting annoying. The title theme song alone has the energy and bounce to draw you in and make you want to find that leprechaun's wig and mix that troll brew and finally face the monstrous wizard Zax. The small details are also a big part of the charm and another mark of the series in future instalments. From the scrolling banners that quote lines from the poem from which the game is inspired from, the callback tropes like the ghost hunter's laser, or simply the way Dizzy jiggles on the spot, ready and eager to go. Of course, it's not a faultless masterpiece. For example, falling in the pit makes the game impossible to continue, and it can sometimes feel a little tiresome backtracking the same old screens. But it's a very solid and enjoyable game which sets the standard for what is to come. Similar to the original Sonic or Mario, if you want to make that comparison, Dizzy's first attempt was a solid experience that, sure, may be a little rough around the edges and obviously it would be overshadowed by what come next, but it did everything it needed to to get great reviews and more importantly start a journey of gaining its rightful reputation as home computing's unofficial flagship mascot. As time moved on after that first game, the duo continued to pump out highly rated and brilliant selling games under the Codemasters banner. I think it's time for a montage. Yes, here we are, Treasure Island Dizzy. And you know that's what it is because the game tells you when you boot it up. It had been a while since the two had dealt with Dizzy, but they were indeed well aware of his growing success. Plenty of fan mail had made its way into the offices by this point, and although it was still early days for everybody's favourite shell-covered organic vessel, the outcry for a sequel was real, and the Oliver Twins had no issue in giving the fans what they wanted with Treasure Island Dizzy. A game released in December of 1988 and only started development a few months before. 
Whilst we were really pleased with the creativity of the original Dizzy game, its sales were relatively slow. It did attract an enormous amount of fan mail at Codemasters offices, many of them asking for another Dizzy game. As time went by, Dizzy sales didn't drop off, as is common with most games, and it kept on selling. So finally, over a year since the original Dizzy, we thought it was time to produce a sequel. Treasure Island Dizzy was the title which gave our eggy friend the traction that he needed to stake claim to be a recognised mascot of the 8-bit computer era. The success of the game even managed to somersault jump Dizzy to over to the 16-bit computers. Many elements are added to the format to build on Dizzy 1 which saw the world of Dizzy become a more varied and rounded fantasy world. No longer would Dizzy pick up only a single item as now there was an infantry system implemented which reduced the need for backtracking considerably and also gave the player a chance to strategically plan ahead. The introduction of hidden items, the collection of coins, characters to talk with, surprising traps and the treehouse area, all of which would become part of future instalments. This combination of challenges reduced the need for enemies and balanced the game well. In this outing, Dizzy has to escape a desert island, collecting items and solving puddles much like the first game, but not to vanquish a foe, but to build a boat to the mainland. However, this time it's a one life deal. No extra eggs here, and this is something which again happened by accident at the hands of the Oliver Twins. The graphics are presented similar to the first game, but with a little bit more detail, smoother animation, some lovely water scenes and more happening generally on screen. It certainly feels a more vibrant world this time around. Music duties are handed over to the legendary 8-bit video game composer David Whittaker, with two catchy tunes which suit the setting nicely. We even get a little bit of the trademark Oliver Twins sampled speech. Its presentation is better in all aspects of that of Dizzy One, but let's get to the big issue here. One Life. Uno. One squared. The slightest touch of a hazard and it's scrambled egg. This does make the game very unforgiving, some say even the most difficult of the series, and is somewhat to its detriment. In fact the Olivers did want a life system, but discovered if you drop the snorkel while underwater, the resulting death would respawn you but leave the snorkel underwater which then became unrecoverable. The quick solution was to have a single life, as recoding the infantry system would have proved to be too time consuming. Even so, with its blend of thoughtful puzzles, comedy elements, multiple ways of completing tasks and a high graphical and musical appeal, Treasure Island Dizzy would become a big hit and firmly establish a core fan base for the franchise. It's fair to say that the game sold well, like really well. That first game, as already stated, set the groundwork, but this game really did expand on the overall world and was just simply a better game. The reviews were great, the sales were ballistic, as Philip put it, and there was no doubt in the Oliver Twins' mind that Dizzy would return. Several times over, in fact. Treasure Island Dizzy will always stick with me personally. It was the first game I ever played in the series, and although I don't remember completing it for many, many years, mainly due to the one life you're dead, oh, let's just go play something else mentality that five-year-old me had at the time, it will always be a cherished game from my youth that I simply couldn't be more thankful for. Sure, it's not aged all that well, being surpassed by its more recent titles, but Come on, nostalgia's gonna win with this one, I'm afraid, and I have no problem admitting that. And whilst we're on the subject of my own personal nostalgia, I think now is a better time than any to talk about the first game I ever completed, Fast Food, or Fast Food Dizzy. <laughs> For this game, Philip and Andrew went back to their roots. As stated earlier on, they spent a lot of time in arcades on holiday playing all of the obvious arcade classics and Pac-Man was obviously one of those titles. After failing to recreate a version for themselves back on their crusty old ZX81, they decided to give it another go, in record time I might add. If you think creating a groundbreaking game that pulls on the heartstrings of all middle aged men in the space of only two months is crazy fast work, which is what they did with the Treasure Island Dizzy release among others, well, with Fast Food Dizzy, the two did something they practically never did up to this point. They stopped working on what they was working on, that being Grand Prix Simulator 2, and they got distracted. On a random Friday somewhere in the middle of 1989, they decided to give themselves a break and once again tried to pay homage to Pac-Man, just as long as they were back to work on Grand Prix Simulator 2 by the following Monday. Meaning that the first game I ever completed was created in just one weekend. 
The aim of the game is pretty simple. You run around a map collecting fast food instead of fruit because, as Oliver stated in a Retro Gamer interview, Give me a burger any day over a bunch of grapes. And here they are, eating said burgers for a marketing shot, which they didn't get permission for, I might add. <laughs> and um, there really isn't much else to this title. You collect all the fast food and try to do it without these little mechanical looking, definitely not ghosts, getting hold of you. Now, unlike Pac-Man, some food actually runs away from you, like the chicken. Get it? And dotted about each maze are the odd power-ups that might let you freeze enemies or make them vulnerable to your attacks. You know, all that standard good video game stuff. It's not exactly groundbreaking, but if you ask me, it's a great little first spin-off to everybody's favourite digitised egg. Now originally this title didn't actually star Dizzy. After a weekend of working on the game, the twins showed the Pac-Man inspired Gobblem up to Codemasters, who expressed an interest in teaming up with the restaurant chain Happy Eater. The twins liked this idea and left it with them and carried on working on that Grand Prix title. That deal however, for whatever reason, fell through and the game was quickly sprite swapped into the next Dizzy release. And yep, just like before the reviews came in rather splendidly. Although it was far removed from the previous Dizzy titles, us Dizzy fans lapped it up. Not bad for two days work, right? Not at all! Now if you're thinking to yourself with all of this eggy success that the Oliver Twins would just simply pump out nothing but Dizzy games from here on out, you would be... wrong. As stated, the two were well underway with BMX Simulator 2 already, which sold well. But they also pumped out Championship Jet Ski Simulator and Operation Gunship 2 for Codemasters. However, during this period, they also dropped Ghostbusters 2 for Activision, which again, I owned, I loved, I had no idea up until a few years ago that the Oliver Twins ever worked on it, and well, <laughs> that was a nice surprise. But let's save that for a dedicated Ghostbusters video in the future shall we? Because after this the Oliver Twins went dizzy crazy because out of their 11 next games, 10 of them would be focused on, you guessed it, Dizzy. The first up was Fantasy World Dizzy. The game was yet again Philip and Andrew's attempt at creating something not only in time for Christmas but also better than the two previous Dizzy games before it. They did this by learning from their mistakes, giving our hero free lives again and adding a text box window so you can talk to plenty of characters scattered throughout the game. Now if my memory serves me correctly, this was the first proper Dizzy game that I ever completed. But looking back, I actually think it was because this game brought so much more to the Dizzy universe, way more than any game before it. Because in this game not only can you talk to random trolls or whatever, but you also get to talk to and get introduced to all of Dizzy's family. And boy, what a ragtag bunch they are. Well, you got Dylan, who was definitely not inspired by Neil from the young ones. Denzel was no way inspired by the Fonz from Happy Days. Dizzy's girlfriend Daisy took absolutely no inspiration from Daisy from the Dukes of Hazard. Dora wasn't based on Velma from Scooby-Doo. Dozy wasn't based on Sleepy from Snow White. And no way are you going to tell me that Grand Dizzy was based on Grandad from Only Falls and Horses, right? Wrong. That's exactly who these characters were based on. Ha ha ha. Only Fools and Horses and the Young Ones, this is becoming a very, very British episode. If you are outside of the UK and you're watching this still, let me know down below. And if you know what these TV shows are, give yourself a massive pat on the back. Anyway, the game looked better than anything before it and fully breathed new life into the franchise. To help better understand this on a worldwide scale, Dizzy Free can be compared to Super Mario Bros. 3. It was that significant. Also, according to the twins, this game actually had the best box art of all of the Dizzy games. In fact, a lot of what you've seen in this game would make its way over to future installments, including the incredible Fantastic Dizzy which we'll get to very shortly, and the long lost Mystery World Dizzy game too, but again, we'll get to that one shortly. America had Pac-Man fever and us home computer users in the UK had Dizzy um, spells. 
It had fully taken over Europe by this point, and fans of all ages were lapping it up. The little £1.99 and eventually £2.99 titles had gone on to sell over a million copies by this point, and Codemasters simply couldn't keep up with the barrage of fan mail focused on the yoke folk. And to try and combat these overwhelming requests for help by the fans, the Oliver Twins got their sister to record the solution on an audio cassette and then added a premium hotline number into the game. This worked out brilliantly for them. Not only because now little Jimmy had just worked out that the sleeping potion is supposed to be used on the dragon, but also because the Oliver Twins reportedly had earned just as much money charging people for the answers to their games than they did in standard game royalties. Ah, oh, you sly little buggers. By this point, there was no denying just how important the Oliver Twins had been for the Codemasters. However, due to no real agreement being put in place on who actually owned Dizzy, it's fair to say that a fire was indeed beginning to erupt between the two giants. The time for Dizzy to move into bigger and better things was fast approaching. So, to bring you all up to speed, the year is now 1989. Christmas of 1989 to be exact, and even though the Dizzy games had done well on the old 8-bits, it's fair to say that towards the end of the 80s and to the beginning of the 90s, the time for moving on was getting near. But that's easier said than done. The home computer scene had done everyone proud so far, but as shelf space had dropped off in the wake of whatever was coming next, it was decided that a trip to Las Vegas to attend the 1990 Consumer Electronics Show would be a great way to get a peek as to what was the next big thing. Can you guess? It's 1990, it's America, it's obviously the Nintendo Entertainment System that was completely obliterating the showroom floor, and because of its crazy amount of fans, it was dominating sales, way more than what we had going on with the home computers in the UK, and it was doing so at $40 a pop. There was no way the twins didn't want to get involved, especially after hearing that this Super Mario Brothers game, whatever that is, had just sold over 20 million units. Yes, this was the gaming space that they needed to be in. However, come on, let's face some facts here. As great as those early Dizzy games are, they are far from $40 releases that Nintendo fans had come to expect in America. The core mechanics, the gameplay, the music, the style, the everything was indeed present in these British budget £1.99 titles. But one thing is for sure, they didn't really have the length. If they were going to make games for the Nintendo Entertainment System, the time to up the ante was indeed now. Strangely enough, they actually started working on a port of BMX Simulator first, as they had already ported that from the Commodore 64 to the Amstrad and Spectrum beforehand, and felt it would be the easiest way to get to grips with the NES, but again, on the home computers. But BMX Simulator? That was probably a little bit too micro for Nintendo's American audience, so it got reworked into something completely different. But we will save that for the eventual Micro Machines complete history. Anyway, next up was a rather beefy port of Fantasy World Dizzy, which was being made with a longer work schedule of seven months at the same time as Quick Snacks, a sort of follow up to fast food. So let's get Quick Snacks out of the way quickly. Sorry. There is no escaping the fact that Quick Snacks is kind of like fast food too, with a similar top-down arcade viewpoint and Pac-Man style gameplay. For me however, it is the better game. The ability to squish enemies with blocks while collecting all the fruit to progress to the next stage is a great addition, even if it does make the game a little easier of that of fast food. The bonus stages where Dizzy is sliding on ice also add another element, but the highlight for me and many others is the variety of music played throughout the game, and on the Spectrum version you have the Yoke Folk Band playing the theme song on the title screen. Out of all the spin-offs, Quick Snacks is one of the best of the bunch. Anyway, back to the fantastic adventures of Dizzy. As stated, the game took a little longer to develop than expected, and by the time it was created, both Dizzy and Micro Machines couldn't get released because of the Game Genie. Oh yes, that was the other thing that Codemasters had done. They designed the Game Genie and Nintendo just wasn't happy. Legal battles pushed back the release of these titles and even though Dizzy actually scored the same as Super Mario Brothers in certain magazines for the American folk when it was eventually released, it didn't sell very well at all. 
Why? Because the year was 1991, and not only was Sega in the middle of its Mega Drive and Genesis takeover, the Super Nintendo had not long been released too. They were originally worried about the home computer sections in shops in the UK dropping off by this point, but the exact same thing had happened to the NES in the States. And to make matters worse, the game was 100% unofficial. So... No Nintendo seal of approval here, meaning that not every shop would want to stock it. Thankfully, the game did get ported several times, including onto the incredible Mega Drive, which is obviously the version I played the most, and it's quickly become one of my favourite games for the system. Hang on, is that a bit of a nostalgia slopes? Oh yes. Don't get me wrong, I love me some Dizzy, and the game is good, but it's so big. I completed it a couple of times with save states, but to this day, I've only ever finished it once without save states. Seriously guys, if you've got this game, don't be ashamed of using save states. It actually makes it a better game, a far more tolerable game, if you ask me. Why? Because this game does everything the older games did and more. Obviously turning what are essentially puzzle fetch quests into a several hour experience sure does sound dull. And it would be if it didn't include several mini game type sections that brilliantly break up the gameplay. Some of those sections were actually so good, or should I say good enough, to get their own spin-offs. Bubble Dizzy was taken from the pirate section in Fantastic Dizzy, which I suppose is actually a more arcade like add-on from Treasure Island Dizzy. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you. Regardless, both versions are incredibly hard to nail exactly how to play them. The fat bubbles go slower and last longer, whereas the smaller bubbles go up faster but don't last as long before they pop. You need to get to the top, dodging obstacles, collecting random stuff and basically just trying not to let Dizzy drown. And in the NES version of this game, you had this section where you could awkwardly control our eggy hero down a fast flowing stream in a barrel similar to, and inspired by, Tubin. This also got a home computer port with Dizzy down the rapids. As already stated, this wasn't in the Mega Drive version that I played, but I am looking forward to playing through it on the Evercade collection when that is eventually released. Anyway, back to Fantastic Dizzy on the Mega Drive. As stated, these little sections include the minecart area, the bow and arrow area, and the little extra life puzzle areas all make for great fillers between these fetch quests. Now, nostalgia aside, it is easy to see the flaws in this game, such as the fact that it quite literally has way too many puzzles to solve. The rats in the underground sections are virtually impossible to dodge, it has more backtracking than the entire Metroid series as a whole, and worst of all, the 250 stars that you see dotted around the game, which you think are there just for the completionists of the world as an added bonus, well, they're actually here because they're needed. If you want to go up against the final, rather underwhelming boss, Zax, you're going to need to get them all, resulting in plenty more backtracking. But with all that said, I absolutely adore Fantastic Dizzy. It's a game that I just like to put on, relax and play. Sure, I almost never complete this game when I play it, but I have fun failing. For me, it's one of the most memory-tugging games of my entire life. I know the exact place I bought it from. Bangham's Records in Cranbrook, Kent, in case you were wondering. What I had to do to save the money to get it. Mowing the garden and doing the shopping for mum. And best of all, I remember so many Eureka moments solving the puzzles, like looking into your inventory to get a better look at Grand Dizzy's medicine recipe and sussing out that you need the bottle, star plant and mushroom. It's such a great game for me. I understand why so many people are confused when playing it. The same goes for all Dizzy games, actually. Many will argue what is best, but for me, there is no better place to start your Dizzy journey than with this game. As a comparison for the Yanks that are watching, Fantastic Dizzy is the Ocarina of Time, or Link to the Past, of the Dizzy series. And even though Fantastic Dizzy definitely has its flaws, it's the whole package. 
Anyway, whilst all this was going on with the NES release of the game, the UK home computer market still wanted their cheap to make and cheap to produce Dizzy games, goddammit. And to help battle this, the Oliver Twins formed Dizzy Enterprises Limited, another family run studio built up with the sole purpose to get outside help on these Dizzy games, such as the already mentioned Quick Snacks, Bubble Dizzy, and Dizzy Down the Rapids, whilst Philip and Andrew could continue with creating NES titles. Big Red Software to the rescue, who worked with Philip and Andrew on the fourth properly released title in the series. They went under the development title Zack's Revenge, but would eventually be renamed to Magic Land Dizzy. Sometimes known as Dizzy 4, as the game screen HUD displays proudly at the top, this was actually the sixth game, and later on remade to become the 17th game. But let's not get bogged down with all this superfluous stuff and get into the real question here. Is this first Dizzy Adventure not written by the Oliver Twins any good? If the reviews at the time were to go by, then yes. Big Red did a sterling job. By taking the advancements of Fantasy World, using storybook references and the same infantry system, and then adding an energy bar and shiny diamonds to collect, Magic Land became a fan favourite instantly. Tasked to rescue each of his family members from the devious spells of Zax, we have all the familiar dizzy visuals, jolly tunes, and exploration that have come before, and the likes of Prince Charming and the Queen of Hearts making cameo appearances. There is even a Pac-Man gag reference made. Magic Land Dizzy plays safe, however, sticking to the traits of its predecessor in terms of longevity and style. And to be frank, this works. It feels like Big Red didn't want to make any drastic changes to a proven format, and gave us essentially Fantasy World Dizzy 2. I mean, it really does feel like a true sequel. With all the Yoke Folk present and the returning antagonist, it adds a nice synergy to the series. It was also hyped for the ZX Spectrum 2, with an exclusive prequel game, Into Magic Land, being released with Crush Magazine. If we were to judge the Dizzy series like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Magic Land signals the end of Phase 1 for me, with the later games trying more adventurous stuff across more platforms. The ground roots for the series going forward were now fully laid out. And Magic Land Dizzy wasn't the only game that Big Red Software worked on, don't you know? It was still 1991 at this point, and even though the Oliver Twins and Codemasters were juggling with the NES fanboys in the States and the home computer fanboys in the UK, they just picked themselves up a Game Boy and discovered the hardcore addictiveness that was Tetris. So, obviously, it was time to tackle the puzzler market, yeah? Panic Dizzy was the game they came up with after trying to work out how to inject Dizzy into some kind of Tetris type game. The final result was actually partly based on a dream that Philip had after thinking about this concept rather little too hard. He woke up, wrote it down and handed it over to Big Red to get it done, presumably then had a cup of coffee afterwards. Dizzy Panic was yet again another one of those games that I had on some random compilation, probably a homemade compilation if I'm going to be honest and I became quite addicted to it. Obviously it didn't play like a traditional Dizzy game, as this time you control a conveyor belt going left and right, making sure to drop shapes into the right coloured slots. It sounds easy, however the catch with this game is the fact that it wanted you to drop four at the same time. Getting just one at a time isn't good enough, and the whole time you're doing this, the tubes that drop the shapes are slowly moving down the screen, creating a smaller playing field for you to work with. Double this up with the fact that the game constantly gets harder, offering up more shape variations, and what you're left with is a title that is really quite calm, it's quite relaxing from the get-go, but frantically stressy as time moves on. The game got some decent reviews and sold quite well, but we thought about it a lot afterwards, trying to work out how to add that element of addictiveness to make a great puzzle game, and would later try again with Panic Dizzy on the NES. And although we are going to jump ahead a little bit here, now is probably the best time to bring up Panic Dizzy, not to be confused with Dizzy Panic, which was an NES game that never got released back in the day until it eventually did over on Kickstarter back in 2019. No, 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 this was a good one. Confused? So was I working on this episode. Even though the game shares a similar name, it plays nothing like Dizzy Panic at all. 
So what you have here is actually an incredibly confusing mix between a reverse Tetris and a Rubik's Cube. In one game, you need to pull down different card classes and throw them back up in order to create a set with hearts, diamond, clubs, and spades. Another game involves you pulling down and resorting shapes into sets of the same shape. Another mode lets you try and reorganize small diagonal, horizontal, and vertical lines in order to create three of the same in a row, making sure to get them all pointing the right way. Another mode actually feels more like a Minesweeper spin-off than anything else, requiring you to take one single path across a mashup of blocks with numbers on them, making sure to go over each block the required number of times that it states on the block in an attempt to remove every block and not end up in a dead-end scenario. And finally, yet another requires you to pull apart broken segments of a picture to try and rearrange them in their correct order. Honestly, the game is a mixed bag. I wouldn't go as far as to say it's bad, it's really not. After all, it's a simple and addictive puzzle game with a dizzy stamp slapped on top of it that honestly does what it needs to do, you know, be a simple and addictive puzzle game with a dizzy stamp on top of it. Instead of finding one style that really works, what you have here is five that all play similar to each other, yet the more you play them, the more you will probably just choose one or two and gravitate towards those until you get bored and play something far more established like, I don't know, Tetris, Columns or Pio Pio. And before we move into the proper lineup of Dizzy games, there is still one more to bring up here, the unreleased handheld LCD game, also called Panic Dizzy, which was essentially a match free of triangles and circles and square based on the Dizzy Panic Kickstarter, but this never obviously got released. Why? Because Codemasters were working on something far more interesting, the Aladdin Deck Enhancer. Now for those that don't know, the Aladdin Deck Enhancer was Codemasters and their American distributor Comerica's way of releasing cheaper titles for the NES without having to go through Nintendo's approval. The way they would do this would be to include all of the usual components found in every NES cartridge and put them into the adapter, whilst the actual cartridge that stored the game would simply just store that, the game, also known as the ROM. As stated, because of this, it got the price of these brand new cartridges down to under $20 a pop, which was great for all of those parents that saw the already released Genesis and Super Nintendo systems as nothing more than cash grabs. Over 30 million homes already had NES systems at the time, and I'm sure you will all agree, even to this day, that this was actually a great idea. Except that it wasn't. The cool idea was just simply too late. Every game released for the system, which by the way came to the grand total of seven, was already released in either a standard format or a multi-cart format. And Comerica ended up going under shortly after making the Aladdin Deck Enhancer, making it an extremely pointless yet expensive and highly sought after collectible. Anyway, you've all seen the Gaming Historian's brilliant video on the Aladdin Deck Enhancer, which was home to three Dizzy games and a spin-off, which we're going to be looking at right now. If I was to sum up Dizzy Prince of the Yoke Folk in a few words, it would be Magic Land but shorter and strangely more fun. My opinion only of course. Chuck in some cherry collecting and the setting really isn't nothing outrageously different from the 8-bit or 16-bit micros than the fourth adventure. So why did this become a highlight of the series, a fan favourite and the first to be ported to the iOS and Android? Originally only supposed to be featured on the compilation Dizzy's Excellent Adventures, the game got a single release. Taking the format back to basics from Spellbound Dizzy, this game was only a third of the size and took away lots of the features and changes that we had seen in Dizzy 5. And that's another thing, Yoke Folk was released four months before Spellbound, yet known as Dizzy 6. I know, let's not try to explain why. Anyway, this simpler game was an attractive prospect for the consoles, and by borrowing the story and map layout, Dizzy the Adventurer made it to the NES, via the Aladdin Deck Enhancer of course, and it also made it onto the Master System and Game Gear. To get another Dizzy game on the NES was a wise move in the wake of the success of the Fantastic Adventures of Dizzy, but a third Dizzy game made it to the NES as well, with Treasure Island Dizzy, that's Dizzy 2 for those keeping up, getting a port as part of the Quattro Adventure compilation. This egg can surely get around, no? Also at this point, hints had been given to a beloved pet Fluffle Dizzy owned, in an arcade style game by the name of Dreamworld Pogi. 
you took control of the titular character to escape 15 levels of platform puzzling as you entered his dream state. However, due to the Oliver's focusing on the release of Dizzy the Adventurer, the subsequent fall of Camerica and the twins leaving Codemasters in 1994, Dreamworld Pokey was unfortunately shelved. Until, yep, you've guessed it, the Dizzy fan site, along with programmer Lucas Kerr, resurrected Pogi in full glory and released the NES version in 2016. Yet another example of a game left in limbo but brought back to life because of the somewhat fanatical support for the Dizzy lore. I, of course, include myself in that category. And as Novabug just brought up that Dreamworld Pogi spin off Dizzy game, we might as well bring up the Seymour games too. Now you will remember that Big Red Studios who had helped make the first non-Oliver Twins game Magic Land Dizzy, right? Well, they came up with another game called Dizzy Goes to Hollywood, which although was accepted at first by the Oliver Twins, was eventually rejected as the twins wanted to keep Dizzy in a fantasy-like setting. This resulted in the game still getting made, but becoming Seymour Goes to Hollywood instead. Obviously not as popular as the Dizzy games, it still did get fairly popular reviews and spawned a few sequels of its own. If you run out of Dizzy games, then give this one a shot. But for now, let's look at Dizzy 5, better known as Spellbound Dizzy. Yet again, another game created by Big Red with the help of Philip and Andrew Oliver. By this point, you know the deal. Dizzy needs to collect things, to go with other things, that make things happen, that open up the ability to put more things together. Things! However, what makes this game different than the other home computer Dizzy games is the fact that Dizzy can now take damage. He has added animations depending on the damage and action that you take throughout the game, which adds to the overall cartoony charm of the character. You now only hold two items in your inventory, but you do get the ability to eventually hold four with the help of a bag, which obviously helps. And besides all of this, the rest is pretty much your simple Dizzy fare. It's definitely a lot bigger than most Dizzy games up to this point and it's a great game to get stuck into for newcomers after fantastic dizzy of course don't ever expect to finish it because it's just way too big but at the same time do prepare yourself for a really good time that is unless you play an earlier release on the commodore 64 which was so buggy and even had a glitch that put dizzy into the loading screen with no way out still a good fun time as was dizzy and the treasure of the yoke folk eventually renamed to crystal kingdom dizzy aka dizzy number seven Whilst the Olivers continued trying to tackle the US console market, the Codemasters pushed on to create another release for the UK market. With new programmers and minimal input from the Olivers, this game would actually be the final proper entry for the aging home computers, so Codemasters decided to try and go out with a bang, selling the title for £19.99 for the ST and Amiga and £9.99 on the Spectrum, Amstrad and C64. Crystal Kingdom was an attempt by the Codys to bring Dizzy up a level for a final swan song on the home micros. Bringing in a new coding team with visual impact, reflective designs and synergy, Dizzy 7 had many new additions and even changed the core gameplay to a degree. The C64 and CPC had bespoke versions playing to their strengths, not being based off the Spectrum version. Alterations to the key jumping mechanics, a password system to access four separated levels, a general graphical look which was a vast departure from the previous Dizzy titles, made Crystal Kingdom a somewhat polarising game to fans. This sparked a fire for a remake of the Spectrum version released in 2017, and I myself have often wondered what this title done in the older graphical style would have been like on the CPC. Still, it's more of the same puzzle solving adventuring with lovely music and visuals, but it doesn't quite have the charm of the previous instalments. Maybe it's the inflated price tag for essentially a budget game, or maybe giving a new direction to the series just wasn't required for the home micros at this point. Even so, it's an interesting footnote in the Dizzy story, and while I have a soft spot for its unique differentness, yeah, that's, that's a real word I just made up, it's not one of the highlights of the series, really only for hardcore eggheads. Which finally brings us to Go Dizzy Go, the final official Dizzy game. Except, of course, that it wasn't. 
yet again, we have a spin-off. A very similar spin-off to Quick Snacks, actually, where you control Dizzy running around the screen, collecting fruit and dodging the bad guys. Honestly, there really isn't much more to it than that. By this point, even the puzzle games have that unique Dizzy stamp on them, and even though this wasn't believed to be good enough for a standalone release, it did get bundled into several already released titles, including into the Game Gear and Master System too. Go Dizzy Go was originally released for the NES Quattro Adventure cartridge with Boomerang Kid, Super Robin Hood and Soccer Simulator, which is a rather odd mashup of games if you ask me, before it made its way onto Game Gear and Master System. Again, as a packing title, however this time, it was bundled with the previously mentioned Dizzy the Adventure and Panic Dizzy with an extremely low print run. It was designed on the Quick Snacks formula and is extremely similar, pushing blocks to trap bad guys and picking up the fruits where you can. The extra level at the end of each main stage is slightly different as it only lets you go in one direction until you hit a wall, kind of like the mice in Choo Choo Rocket. And well, that's Go Dizzy Go. Not much else really needs to be said about this title again. If it looks up your street, then it probably would be up your street. And that was the end of Dizzy. Go Dizzy Go, Panic Dizzy and Dizzy the Adventurer were released as a compilation cartridge back in 1993, the same year as the Mega Drive release of Fantastic Dizzy. And if this compilation was released only a few weeks later, the almost finished game Wonderland Dizzy, which would have been the eighth Dizzy game, would have been included too. But it wasn't. Why? Because the world of gaming was changing. Codemasters were desperately trying to catch up. The Oliver Twins were constantly creating games whilst Codemasters were battling it out in court. And because of this, a lot of the Oliver Twin games never got released. And the ones that did, well, they didn't get marketed properly at all. It was clear that the Darlings and their marketing department wanted to release games for an older crowd, and in their eyes, Dizzy, a series that did brilliantly for the home computer market, wasn't going to be a franchise that the console market would ever get behind. According to the Oliver Twins, the hype was still real. People wanted more Dizzy games, but it seems the Codemasters just didn't want to give it to them. That final compilation was heavily delayed and was produced onto only 5,000 cartridges. It sold out rather quickly and no second print run ever got created. The Oliver Twins were struggling. I mean, obviously they were. Dizzy Enterprises were still making games at Codemasters requests, but they weren't paying them because they weren't releasing them half the time. Because of this, Dizzy Enterprises almost went bankrupt. And in that Let's Go Dizzy book, it states that Richard Eddy, the marketing manager for Codemasters, simply told the Twins right out, Don't you get it? We're not interested in Dizzy anymore. This, among everything else, put a huge barrier between the two sets of twins that wouldn't be resolved for over a decade. The Oliver twins felt cheated and in a desperate attempt to get some more money behind them to pay their own employees, Dizzy Enterprises started to look elsewhere for work. But nobody seemed interested in projects related to Dizzy, and to combat this, the duo changed the name to Interactive Studios Limited. This eventually led to work on games such as Judge Dredd and porting titles such as Marco, Syndicate, and Theme Park on the Mega CD. The studio would again get changed to Blitz Games, and for a while, things were looking up for the Oliver Twins, releasing content for the PlayStation 1. Anyway, I could continue going on about the Oliver Twins outside of the world of Dizzy, but that's not why you're here. What you're here for is what came 20 years after the last proper Dizzy game, the return of Dizzy, quite literally. Dizzy Returns. Except he didn't come back, because Dizzy Returns was a Kickstarter that was a massive failure. The Kickstarter campaign was the Oliver Twins' chance to finally bring back Dizzy and to do it in a way that they always wanted. They asked for £350,000. 
and ended up getting £25,620. Was the goal too high? Were the rewards too low? Was it the fact that the campaign didn't actually show any gameplay footage, but instead endless amounts of these stunning drawings? Well, it's probably a mixture of all three. If the drawings were even close to what was promised, this would have been incredible. Sadly, 839 backers were just not enough to bring Dizzy back. In fact, according to my calculations, if the average backer spent £30.53, which was the case here, they would have actually needed 11,464 backers to get this project funded. In other words, it was never going to happen. Sadly. Anyway, it wasn't a success, and that's the sad truth of it. It is what it is. But what was successful was the Let's Go Dizzy book, the already mentioned Panic Dizzy and Dream World Pogi, Wonderland Dizzy and Mystery World Dizzy. Seriously, these guys just kept finding games they already finished or almost finished in their attics and releasing them in limited quantities on Kickstarter with great success. Wonderland Dizzy and its counterpart Mystery World Dizzy are both on the NES and released in 2015 and 2017 respectively. They share many common traits with each other but surprisingly play a bit differently. Both were planned for release in the early 90s, both were based off previous home micro games, both had the majority of the code already wrote almost 28 years ago. But after being reincarnated with the help of Andrew Joseph's Yokefolk.com, Wonderland feels the more progressive game while Mystery feels more polished. The latter is certainly the cleaner looking game. Big solid primary colours, strong outlines, a familiar if a bit slippy control system and basically everything you would expect of a shortish adventure based off fantasy world Dizzy. Wonderland however adds some new ingredients to the omelette, making it a little different than an expanded Magic Land Dizzy. For the first time you can choose to play as Daisy or as a tag team with Dizzy. This is a nice novel addition and it does feel fun to be controlling a different egg creature for a change. It also adds an element of strategy too, as upon a mishap, the tagged character resumes from where the Perish one previously left off. Oh, and there's also the small matter of a magic carpet, which can be used to avoid a whole section of the overground world once unlocked. Wonderland Dizzy does feel the more adventurous title, if a little rough around the edges in terms of visuals. Out of the two titles though, Wonderland is the more fulfilling game, but Mystery hits the nostalgia nails right on the head. Especially if, like me, your favourite Dizzy title was Fantasy World to begin with. Which finally brings us to Wonderful Dizzy, the final game we're going to be talking about today. A game for the ZX Spectrum Next, a game that's not even out yet, and therefore a game that I can't really talk to you guys about. But I sure as hell can get the Oliver Twins themselves to do that very thing. Uh, so Wonderful Dizzy started as an idea after we saw the original Crystal Kingdom Dizzy uh, remake. We were really impressed at how good it was. We reached out to the guys and complimented them on how good it was, but, but it, Andrew and I just thought, well, what's the point in remaking a, an original Dizzy game? Wouldn't it be really cool if these guys actually made a new Dizzy game? If we designed a game, that they would actually make it and we'll work with them. Um, but obviously that would require a design and we wanted to do, do the design, we're very passionate about it. And we were having that discussion, and at the same time, the Kickstarter came up for the Spectrum Next. So we foolishly said, hey, you know what, if you hit the next kind of uh, stretch goal, we, we could do a new Dizzy game. We, we just made the joke, oh, like if you're bringing back a new Spectrum, we could make you a Spectrum game. And unfortunately, they hit that stretch goal, which we kind of knew they would, but then that kind of committed us to doing uh, a Dizzy game. Because an old Spectrum, you can't plug into an HDMI, and it's all a bit different loading tapes and stuff but it's the proper experience and we said oh that's really really cool that you're bringing it all back but spectrum keeping it to the spectrum keeping it to that size and scale there is an art form in actually squeezing stuff into such a limited capacity sort of memory ram resolution and everything else and i'll be honest we look back on the games we made so we were fitting our all of these games fit into 34k you can't fit an iphone icon into 34k and yet we had full games all the graphics all the animations all the music games with like 100 different screens um, 30 different items loads of dialogue and characters and like, how did how did we i mean we we have problems getting our heads around how the hell we fitted that into big 4k and we did it <laughs> it's just like the one thing dizzy liked to do is be familiar because we were always limited graphics we deliberately picked on familiar 
things so that you didn't have to fill in all the backstory because people kind of get it. That was why we did sort of Jack and the Beanstalk and stuff. So it feels familiar without us having to have masses of dialogue. But Wizard of Oz, like everybody knows it. Everyone knows every reference. And actually, we kind of figured it works because there's actually about seven characters. And so we can do what Daffy Duck used to do, where each character that you know, like Dylan and Daisy and stuff, takes the characters that are actually in the Wizard of Oz story. And it actually works. We would come up with the full script, all the characters, every single piece of dialogue. And in fact, we even need a walkthrough because normally you would test the game by walking through yourself but the game hasn't been written and we don't have the tools and uh, the time to sort of rewrite the game ourselves. So we've actually done like a full walkthrough as well. We did it all on paper the way we used to do and with little tiny counters and tokens where you move around and try to pick up the tokens and leave things around where they are and make sure that there's no way you can get stuck anywhere by putting the wrong object down in the wrong place. Uh, but it feels like he's really close to the end because he's picked up on one or two things saying, oh, what if you do this and this? And uh, <laughs> Philip has been answering like, oh yes. So it's in the debugging stages, I believe. So yeah, Wonderland Dizzy, the newest brand new official Dizzy game is almost here for the Spectrum Next. I got myself involved in the second run of this awesome looking Sinclair Spectrum Next system and I can't wait to boot it up when it eventually drops. For me, the reason I wanted to do this in-depth history piece on Dizzy and the Oliver Twins' huge back catalogue is to showcase just how important they were for gaming as a whole. The European and definitely the UK gaming scene was massively different before the days of the Mega Drive and Super Nintendo. We always hear retro gaming enthusiasts talk about the video game crash of 1983, but for us in the UK it was a very different story. We still had those cheap to make and cheap to produce games that companies like Atari were putting out, but we was getting them at the right price. The only thing we didn't have however was a mascot. That was until Dizzy came along. Just like Mario, this little egg's appearance was based on the limitations of what was available to a couple of bedroom coders for the time. A couple of coders that were obsessed with typing in endless lines of code to make the absolute bare minimum show up on whatever home computer they had at the time. Over time, understanding that code and then using that knowledge to do it for themselves. At the height of the boys' popularity, it was estimated that 17% of all video games purchased in the UK were developed by these two individuals. They not only provided the UK market with way more hits than they could ever want at pocket money prices, they not only propelled Codemasters into the company that they are today, even creating the company's first ever racing game with Grand Prix Simulator, but also they provided a motivational kick up the backside for other bedroom coders to do the very same thing. And that is of course to create a game in your bedroom, go and get it published, and you know what, they are still doing that very thing to this day. Me and Andrew are really, really passionate about kind of inspiring kids to learn to code because it's a fantastic career. I mean, um, we I think we inspired an enormous number of people with the original Dizzy and simulators and all this back in the early days. And we've met so many people who are in the games industry and say they were inspired to learn how to code by playing our games. And obviously, as we've got older and we're not actually physically coding the games ourselves, we still want to do it, but it's, it's harder to sort of work out how to sort of inspire the younger generation to put in the hours to learn the code. So John at Fuse Technology had this absolute passion to develop a programming language which is really, really easy to use. It's a bit like BASIC, but it's closer to sort of C and C++. So basically, he's created this language which he wants to get into schools and get into homes and get into sort of as many people as possible, where basically, you fire it up and you can be making a game of Space Invaders in half an hour, an hour. He's having um, difficulties kind of promoting it, so we just sort of said, well, what you need is some sort of flagship game on it to prove that you can do some really good games. And so we offered to do um, Fast Food, uh, Fast Food Dizzy. I think what Dizzy gave us 8-bit micro owners was a, a much needed mascot. We finally had our Mario. It may be hard to understand or comprehend over three decades later, because it may look a bit naff now. But back then, as a young 80s kid, this was something really special and a real game changer. I don't know, that little egg just seems to have captured the uh, the heart of the retro community. It was pretty much like nothing else I'd played to that point. Everything just worked. It looked amazing, sounded amazing, the puzzles were great. And that is what I'll always remember about Dizzy. This perfect little collection of everything that I enjoyed in gaming. It was 
Owl mascot. It was the first mascot for a lot of us, maybe even before Sonic in a lot of cases, and it just has a special place for that reason. For certain people, it's always going to give them a warm feeling in the pit of their stomach. I think it was something that really, really captured my imagination as a child. I was never really good at them, to be honest, back then. Um, I couldn't work out half the puzzles, and I did. I was one of those people who did phone the Codemasters hotline. It holds very dear place in my heart today. In fact, it's probably the most memorable game for me growing up because it was one of those games that really helped to kickstart what I love about gaming today. It's fantastic, and a thank you to the Oliver Twins for giving us such amazing memories. Thank you very much for, um, I was going to say, believing in it and kind of keeping it alive. Supporting us over the years, playing our games, um, sharing your games, and um, long may it continue. So enjoy, um, continue to enjoy. Hey there guys, please go down into the comments and give me a high five right now if you made it this far into the video. Oh my god, easily the hardest I've ever worked on any video whatsoever. Thank you all so, so much for supporting the show for as long as you have. This is one I've literally wanted to do since the very, very beginning, a franchise that got me into gaming probably, um, uh, retrospectively, yeah, it probably got me into gaming and I, I absolutely adore the Dizzy games and I felt like, you know, a lot of people out in the, in the States and other people around the world, uh, not growing up with Dizzy, not really understanding Dizzy, giving Dizzy a bit of a hard time, I felt like it was finally, it was, it was overdue someone finally shining some good decent light onto this incredibly important game franchise, so yes, I hope you enjoyed it. I've got to give some massive shout outs for this video guys, the biggest one obviously goes to the collaborator of this particular video, Novabug, massively helped out with the uh, episode here, I actually wrote down some of the reviews for himself, checked some of my facts, all that sort of stuff, so thank you so so much, massive shout out goes out to Chris Wilkins who actually uh, uh, published this book, which is pretty awesome, and this book was actually given to me by the Oliver Twins themselves um, at a uh, Play Expo Blackpool couple of years ago uh so thank you oliver twins as well there's more people as well the gaming muso provided music in this there was a lot of collaborators in this video in regards to people providing voices i'll put them down below please go and check out all these channels i don't put them in my video if i don't think they're good they're not all massive so they definitely should be getting your support if you like my stuff then you're probably gonna like theirs too but anyway, let's give a massive shout out to the people that support the show every single month with an extra big shout out going to Aaron Gorman, uh, Andrew Dalton, Andrew Ward, Arista, Benjamin Guy, Big Rico, Bram Perez, Brandon Gold, C64 Television, Caesar, Cheshire One, Krista Wattweiler, Clan Bob, Conrad Constantine, Cromilla, Daniel Terrazes, Dina, Dina81, Dr. J, Expert in Moonology, Game Apologist, Gary Pinkett, Hmm. Hut, Intrigued Gaming, Jabba L. Aiden, Jacob P. aka Avalon James, Jeff Ladd, Jeff Mianowski, Jeremy Rodriguez, Jonathan Hayward, Kevin King, Kingling Reviews, Lucas Softel, Lipped, Man of God 9000, Marcus Kimo Cut Tyndall, uh, Marcus T Michael Towns, Mike Martin, Mind of the Unsane, Mr. Golden, Nicholas Burton, Nick Pollard, Nightwill, Petty Mew, Pretendo64, RetroReversing.com, Retro to Next Gen, aka Lou, Richard Aldegic, uh, Richard Carter, aka Fantastic Dizzy, uh, Rocket Blood, Ronnie Method SSWB, Roven Army, Ryan Holt, Sashi Dog, Samuel Nilsson, Shadow Dragon, Solix Captor, Stephen, Taylor Rainwater, That Gamer, The Cunning Linguist, the Shaded J, Tim Labonte, Tim Lund, Todd Paul Float G, Trans Rights, Vike Echo, Wobbles and Bean, The Wonder Ducks, and Ye Old Hamburglar. As already stated, guys, these people support the show every single month. They get to see stuff early. They get to see what I'm working on and how I'm doing about it. For instance, this particular video, you got to see all of the segments as I was creating them. So you'll see differently edited versions and when I've, where I've made mistakes, where I've had to fix them, all that sort of stuff. So if you want to support the show and you want to, if all that sounds good to you, then click those links down below and support the show. <sighs> But until next time, guys, this is DJ Slope signing out, and hopefully I'll see you all next time. Whoa, that was a big one.